Okay, so I'm going to be reviewing all the books that I read in the year of 2020. I'll try to keep it brief, just talking about how I came to each book, what I thought of it, what I recommend it. So for those who don't know, on Goodreads you can set a annual reading challenge where um, at any point in the year you can uh, put in a reading pledge where you tell Goodreads how many books you want to read in the year. So I always uh, say I want to read 52 books. A book for each week in the year. I usually always surpass my goal, but I always keep it at 52 just so that I have some sort of minimum that I'm working towards. And last year I read about 80 books, so I was quite surprised when I was able to get over 120 this year. Uh, and I think the big thing that allowed me to have this many books on my list is that I started to embrace audiobooks more. Um, and audiobooks, honestly, they just make books so much quicker to digest. If you're really into uh, reading a lot of books, I think audiobooks is a great way to do it. Anyway, so uh, let's start from the bottom. So the first book that I read this year was actually uh, rereading Catcher in the Rye. I grew up in Canada, so you know we don't read a lot of these American classics like Catcher in the Rye, Great Gatsby, uh, in school. Uh, I remember in high school, I just heard about Catcher in, the Rye, Catcher in the Rye, and I tried reading it. Obviously, the protagonist, Holden Caulfield, has that very, like, emo, sad boy way of looking at the world. And, you know, in high school, I wasn't really uh, much of that kind of person. But I think towards the end of college, the beginning of medical school, I started becoming more of, like, a cynic. And so I, I did decide to read this book, also because... You know, part of my current writing project is I'm very interested in YA as a genre. And I think it's kind of interesting to think of Catching the Rye as kind of like uh, one of the original YA novels, even though it is a book technically written for adults. And I learned a lot, actually. I think I learned to see this book as a lot more subtle way of reading adolescence, of reading puberty. Um, entering into adulthood. So I, I definitely enjoyed this reread more than my first time around. The second book I read this year, kind of ironic, uh, Severance by Ling Ma, uh, who actually went to, who actually graduated from the MFA program at the university I went to. This book, Severance, it's, um, it's an interesting book to read at the beginning of 2020. I actually read this book before the COVID uh, pandemic began. It's about this virus that comes from China. And what this virus does is it makes people become basically zombies that are stuck in their daily routines. And they just keep repeating the same uh, daily routine over and over. And they can't really uh, have meaningful advancement in their lives. I do think there are some flaws in terms of character development. The whole book is revolving around her pregnancy and, you know, it can be a little bit cliche at times. The symbolism. I would recommend this book for those of us living through the pandemic. I look forward to seeing what else this author has to is going to put out in her career. Uh, the next thing I read was a book of short stories called 10th of December by George Saunders. Um, I read uh, Lincoln and the Bardo the, uh, in 2019 and I really loved it. It's probably one of my top 10 favorite books I've read in the past few years. George Saunders very quickly became an uh, author that I wanted to read more of. 10th of December definitely did not disappoint. There are some stories that, were thought, that I thought were kind of weird. You know, George Saunders, his thing is that he is a working class guy. He comes from a working class background uh, without much formal education in literature. Sometimes that kind of kind of shoots himself in the foot with that. A lot of the times, the way he represents the working class perspective is by giving the narrators this weird baby voice um, where they don't really speak in full senses or use like he, he likes using like the episcopal like diary format for his working class narrators sometimes I, I think it does work and doesn't make his narrators and characters more relatable but sometimes i think it's a little bit condescending you know like that working class people always talk in the kind of like this uh, like this lower level of english but overall i think this is a great set of stories although i think lincoln and the bardo is probably the best thing that saunders has ever wrote uh the next book i wrote is actually a book of philosophy called we have never been modern bruno latour in this book is quite well known i would even go as far to call this as like a cult classic bruno latour this is where he's definitely showing his his voice which pervades all of his work. At times, it's very humorous, it's very ironic, but sometimes it can be kind of annoying. Uh, I don't think he actually covers a lot of ground in this book. You know, like his 
I find his works are very, it's weird because he, his ideas are quite, quite simple. The ideas of the, of the hybrids, but he loves to use many, many case studies in his works to demonstrate a single point. And it can be quite arduous to get through. I, I also read his book, uh, Pandora's Box, and it was a very similar thing where he's just talking about many, many case studies or stories to talk about one idea. And I think in a work of philosophy, you know, I like the idea of death, but I like the idea of death through argumentation, uh, not necessarily through just constant repetition, which is, I think, what he is, gets stuck in here. Uh, the next thing I read was, <laughs> it's actually a Shakespeare play, Midsummer Night's Dream. This is my New Year's resolution for 2020, was to read more Shakespeare. You know, I, most of the plays I knew were kind of the big tragedies, Hamlet, King Lear, Macbeth, and I was kind of tired of being limited to that to only those plays and so I made it a goal to read as many plays as Shakespeare as possible especially the more obscure ones and what I would do is I would uh, have the books out in front of me but also listen to an audio production of the plays that helped a lot especially I didn't want to use spark notes like I did in high school so I got through quite a few of the uh, Shakespeare plays throughout 2020 and Min Mid Midsummer Night's Dream was the first one the reason why I started with this one is because I was very uh, kind of related to Catch in the Rye. I was very interested in things like Romeo and Juliet, for example, you know, talking about like young love. Midsummer Night's Dream is kind of the adult counterpoint to Romeo and Juliet, playing along similar themes, Shakespeare advocating for the power of, of true love, but also being ironic and criticizing, pointing out the downfalls of that love, interchangeable characters and the people falling in love with the wrong people. I thought it was very entertaining. And I would honestly keep rereading re this play because I think there's a lot going on here for such a something that we often view as very cliche. You know, we roll our eyes when we think of Midsummer Night's Dream. That's something that we probably all had to read in uh, junior high school. The next thing I read was for a book club. This book is called Exit West uh, by Mohsin Hamid. This was it's kind of this guy is kind of like a literary darling of world literature right now. Um, all of his books are on Obama's reading list. And this book, I I found it kind of surprising. I did not expect the format of this book. It's very short. It's almost like a parable in a way. It's about these two lovers who are refugees who I believe they go to the UK. And I always thought this title was an interesting literary game because at once it kind of means exiting to the West, you know, as refugees, but it also means the West exiting, decentering the West as a subject for, for literature. So overall, you know, I didn't get that much out of this book. I think it's a good read just because it kind of recenters our focus on the refugee crisis that is, you know, still going on despite the pandemic. It's something that we need to keep revisiting because it's an extremely important issue. Uh, the next book I read, I, I definitely was going through like a philosophy binge. The next book I read was Ethics by Elaine Bedu. I've always been interested in Badiou, although his works are generally pretty inaccessible. This is the only book that I found that was written in anywhere approximating plain English. It's a very extremely short book. I think it's even less than 100 pages. Badiou does a really good job of just kind of summarizing and distilling the main points of his philosophy. What he does in this book is he tries to ground it in reality, specifically, uh, for example, in the notion of universal human rights and the United Nations. What is the concept of universal human rights? You know, what what are the motivations behind that? What do those rights actually do? That's kind of the main premise of this book. This is like a perfect introduction to Badi's work and probably what will happen is you'll read it and then be like, okay, and then have no desire to read anything else by Badiou, which is I think totally fine. He is probably one of the more important contemporary philosophers kind of at the level of uh, Zizek. Okay, so the next book I read was Department of Speculation. Uh, <laughs> this one was a huge disappointment. I don't know why. So many people love and adore this book, you know, and as someone who loves uh, Maggie Nelson's Bullets, I convinced myself that I must also love this book. You know, it's got that kind of fragmentary style where uh, Jenny Offal, she incorporates personal memoir, uh, climate science, that kind of style, fragmentary writing that uh, I really do love, but this this book just it really did not uh, click with me. It just felt kind of boring, you know. I it, it didn't really have much emotion in it. I didn't feel like the themes or the motifs really connected all that well. It didn't really make me feel anything. Uh, next book is another work of philosophy that was recommended to me by a mentor named called uh, Thomas the Obscure. It's actually not a work of philosophy. It's written by a philosopher. It's kind of like uh, Camus the Stranger. It's quite dense, mysterious, and if you like that, 
like postmodernism that this is a good book for you. Uh, but I think for most people, this book is would be incredibly dull and boring, and it didn't leave much of an impression on me, so I can't really recommend it. Uh, next book I read was uh, this nonfiction book recently written. It's kind of like half literary criticism, half uh, bi biography about the uh, life of Yukio Mishima, the Japanese author. Mishima is someone who is important to me in college. I read, I've read basically all of his uh, English translated books. I'm probably gonna make a video about that, probably doing a tier list video like I did for Murakami. Uh, I don't really remember much about what Rankin talks about. I thought it was, I thought it was a good work of, of scholarship. It just, you know, I think this is the thing with Western writers trying to write about Mishima is that I don't think they really, it's all just speculation. They're not really going to unearth anything that you don't already know from just reading about Mishima on the internet. I wouldn't really recommend it all that much. To be honest, the best Mishima biographies are the ones written by Japanese authors. Um, Persona, for example, the really big fat autobiography. You really want to read those ones if you want to uh, learn more about Mishima. Uh, the next thing I read was Richard II, so this is the beginning of the uh, Henriad plays. Uh, I actually read this play a really long time ago, just randomly on the plane, and I didn't get it at all. I reread it this, this year. I think I understood it better. It's really interesting. This play is a lot more deep and rich and we get it give it credit for it. it's all more formulaic you know the theme is a lot more black and white the whole like poetry of the king versus you know the earthiness of the peasantry or whatever and that true king needs to strike that balance and mediate those two sides of the english world something that the how will seek to achieve in the later plays all right this next book i really enjoyed h's for hawk uh, by helen mcdonald something that i've been meaning to read for a long time uh, it is an existential memoir, I would say, about this, about the author who is really into falconry, takes care of this this hawk, and it's all about her her relationship with that hawk and taming it. Uh, I really also love the way she incorporates her obsession with the author of the Sword in the Stone story. Yeah, I cannot recommend this book enough. Helen McDonald quickly just became one of my favorite authors, and I really look forward to seeing more of her writing. This next book is another massive disappointment, uh, Summon, Summon Rushdie's uh, Keyshot. This is a parody, a retelling of Don Quixote uh, in modern America. You got Keyshot, who's like a pharma rep, a drug rep. The horse becomes the car that Keyshot drives. Dolcinia becomes this like TV reporter that Keyshot becomes obsessed with. The book's about the opioid crisis. The only thing is that the writing is terrible. The writing is so boring and the parallels are so ham-fisted and not interesting at all. There's just no real character development behind Keyshot. There's nothing for me to get emotionally invested in. I think really this book does the opposite of what the original Coyote does, uh, which is to make you empathize with this aging, despairing elderly man who is trying to come to grips with his with his death. And Keisha just doesn't do that. I mean, the, the main character just kind of walks into this abyss at the end of the book, and you're just left wondering why, why did I read this huge uh, sprawling novel for. Um, so big disappointment. I'm really sad that uh, Rushdie spent so much time writing this book. Yeah, I think I was nominated for the Booker Prize. There's this funny, funny thing where Rushdie was really shocked that he didn't win the Booker. Criticism Margaret Atwood that her winning the Booker was really a lifetime achievement award. But honestly, I think Rushdie expected the same. And honestly, this book did not deserve any of its media attention. So sorry, Rushdie, your book sucks. Okay, so the next plays, I want to talk about them individually, but it's just the rest of the Henry ad uh, plays overall. I think I learned a lot, and I definitely have to reread this uh, this tetralogy of plays because I think there's a lot to talk about, and maybe in a separate video I will talk about them. Highly recommend it because I don't think these plays get a lot of airtime. So if you are someone who's interested in reading more Shakespeare, these ones are definitely good ones to delve into. Uh, the next book I read is called The Nix. It's a it's a novel by uh, Nathan Hill. I think this is his debut novel, which is really surprising because it's very well written, very solid. It's pretty long. It's about this dude. I think he's a he, he himself is a novel writer who is trying to solve this mystery but also at the same time trying to figure out where his mom went to abandon him when he was a kid. Now, what I appreciate about this book is that there's this character who's like a gamer obsessed with like Dungeons and Dragons and the narrator is a professor at a college and he is also 
obsessed with the same game. The professor is extremely ashamed of that obsession and tries very hard to keep that covered up. And I think that's an extremely entertaining and fulfilling subplot in the novel. So I recommend the book just based off of that. Uh, Ted Chang's story, uh, Stories of Your Life. You know, Ted Chang is another literary darling. Uh, his short stories have been getting a lot of attention uh, because of the movie Arrival. Honestly, though, I was... Uh, kind of disappointed, you know, Ted Chiang, these are all works of science fiction. I kind of expected more though. You know, I'm a big fan of the author Ken Liu, and what I love about Ken Liu is that he is interested partly in science fiction, and I'd more call him, he's just more like speculative fiction, but you know, he's also able to suffuse his, his uh, cultural heritage as a Chinese American man into his stories, and Ted Chiang is just not interested in that. He's more interested in uh, more interested in aliens and more interested in things that are out of this world. I don't know, I just didn't think his stories were really that that emotionally interesting. Okay, so moving on to Zay Smith's Swing Time. This was another big disappointment. I really loved uh, Zay Smith's White Teeth. Reading this was just a huge, you know, it, it's clear to me that her, her fiction writing has really taken a downswing, that she's not really improving or making advances in her writing style. I do have recommend Z Smith's recent uh, nonfiction. Her essay writing is really where I think she shines. Um, this book, I can't really recommend it. There's not much not much going on here. Uh, Michael Perry's Shark. Michael Perry is a, more of a comedic writer. This is a memoir about his relationship with his job as well as his budding relationship with his future wife. I think it's a great read, very relaxing. Michael Perry, he's someone who's just very relatable and it's just very fun to just enter into his mind and follow his voice. It's just very pleasant. So I recommend this. I recommend this book a lot if you like that kind of thing, like Dave Sedaris kind of writing. Bless Me Ultima. This is a book I also read for a book club and I think this is one of those things that I, I think a lot of American kids read in high school, um, but we don't get this kind of thing in Canada. I really enjoyed this book. Rodolfo and I, I think he died earlier this year, which is very sad. Such a huge figure in a Chicano writing. I really enjoyed this book. It's another one of those books that you don't really think of as a YA book, but it really is. It's a growing up book. It's a Bildung's Roman, tightly written. Cannot recommend it enough if you're interested in reading classics. I also just love this title, and when you get to the part where he asks Ultima to bless him, it's really such a satisfying moment. Alright, so the next two books that I read were the Shakespeare plays Coriolanus and Julius Caesar. These kind of make up the first two in a trilogy of uh, Roman plays, which finish up with Antony and Cleopatra, which I read later on. I highly recommend the Shakespeare in Politics lectures on YouTube on these plays. Um, that lecturer does a really good job of giving you the historic background and doing a really good job of threading the needle of showing how Shakespeare is progressing in his thought about the Roman Empire through these plays. Um, so next book, Murakami's Killing Commendatory. This is his latest uh, fictional work. I talked about this in the tier list video. I think a lot of hardcore Murakami fans were kind of disappointed in this book. You know, clearly Murakami has not really progressed much in his storytelling abilities and what he wants to talk about, but I actually really enjoyed this. I think on the whole, it was a solid read. It's long, it's immersive. I don't think you'll get a ton out of this book, but I think it's written well enough that I would not say it's a bad book to read. I think for a long time, Murakami fans, it might have been a big disappointment. And you could definitely see that where there was, you know, there was some hype, but honestly, it kind of sputtered out when people realized that there was not too much not too much new going on here. All right, so Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. Charles Yu is an author that I've always wanted to dig into. And this this is a book that uh, was published this year. I actually recently won the National Book Award, so I'm very happy about that. I'm not sure if it was well-deserved or not. Uh, honestly, this book was nothing um, that special in terms of its literary quality. I do appreciate what Charles Yu is doing here with his discussions about Chinese-American masculinity, about the Kung Fu guy, the Chinese mafia, like all these kind of stereotypes. I really appreciate that he tried to put that into a work of literature and then the whole conceit about it being a, a script. I think that's really unique and well done. I just don't think that he was doing something that blew my mind. So I, I do recommend this, you know, especially if you're interested in Chinese American culture and Chinese American representation, it's well worth it. This next book, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's kind of a weird edition. Uh, I read Rick Riordan's uh, Lightning Thief, so this is the beginning of the Percy Jackson series. 
Um, I read this just kind of inspired by discussions I had with my girlfriend about the YA genre and this kind of being one of those kind of Harry Potter like classics of the genre and overall I enjoyed it. I wouldn't rec I wouldn't read the rest of the series but it's interesting to see like it, it's essentially Catcher in the Rye but with mythical elements to it. So it's interesting to see how Riordan kind of takes Catch in the Rye and transforms it. Uh, the next book is Yeah Jesse's Homegoing. This was a book that got a lot of hype I think in 2018 or 2019 um, and this is a book that I listened to on audiobook. I thought it was really well written and the audiobook is really well told as well, really well narrated. I highly recommend this book. I think it does deserve the hype. I know some people were kind of not so sure if it was all that great but Yeah Jesse is a really solid writer and her books always get a lot of attention and I think it's well deserved. So the next book I read, I reread Romeo and Juliet. Not much to say here other than that I think every time I read this play I get more and more out of it. I think that it's really uh, sad that this this play gets kind of put down and ignored because it's kind of that cliche foolish young lover, something that you're forced to read in junior high school but it doesn't have much meaning. I don't think that's true at all. Next play I read was Ancient Antony and Cleopatra, you know, it's the third series of that Roman uh, Empire trilogy that I was talking about. I think this is a play that I definitely will have to reread because I think there's a lot going on here that kind of went over my head. I think Cleopatra is such an interesting character in the Shakespearean canon that I think, weirdly enough, doesn't get a lot, she doesn't get a lot of attention. The next book is actually a book I had to read for medical school, and it's the book Wonder. This is also kind of a YA middle grade fiction book about this kid who, I think he has Treacher Collins syndrome. I don't think it's said explicitly in the book, I think it's just implied, but he has a congenital defect where you know there's something going on with his face and then so this is kind of told from his perspective from the kid's perspective also the perspective of his sister and kind of their lives as he enters elementary school and trying to deal with the reactions from his classmates and other adults from seeing his face and then realizing that he's actually a really great kid who has a lot of imagination and it's truly a, a pleasure to read, to read this book. I think this author did a really great thing by writing this book and it certainly has become a staple and a classic in the kind of middle, middle grade literature genre and I hope lots of kids read this book. So next book, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. This is the first time I ever read Anne Lamott and I'm really glad I did. And in this book, it's a lot of her advice as a writing teacher kind of distilled as well as talking about her own life as a writer. I just really enjoy her voice. She has like this very comforting tone to her and I really enjoyed this. If you're a struggling writer <laughs> like I am, I think this is a great book to read. All right, so the next thing I read was play The Two Gentlemen of Rona. And this was when the pandemic was starting and then the online Shakespeare series, The Show Must Go Online started and this was the first thing that they did was because this is the first play that Shakespeare ever wrote. And I think it's just really pleasant. I don't think there's too much going on here, but I think if you're a Shakespeare fan and you like the comedies, this is a good one to do. And the next thing I read was The Nanjing Requiem, which is about the rape of Nanjing, uh, which is about the rape of Nanjing preceding World War II. I read a couple works by Hajin in the past, including his more famous one called Waiting, which I enjoyed. This book, on the other hand, was a little bit of a disappointment. It's more kind of like historical fiction, talking about the perspective of the of a group of women who are protecting people during the during the massacre. He doesn't do a good job of recreating the drama of what's going on. It's, it's really weird to say this about such a horrific, uh, a book about such a horrific event, but the book is a little bit boring and dull and dense. You don't really get that emotionally attached to the characters, even though there's so much, so many horrifying things happening to them. So would I recommend this book? Only if you're really interested um, in learning more about the history. Uh, as a book, as a novel itself, it doesn't really do very much. All right, the next two are also Shakespeare plays. We have Taming of the Shrew and The Tempest. I thought that Taming of the Shrew was interesting. I thought the show must go on. My rendition was really interesting. I wouldn't really recommend it as just kind of pleasure reading. Tempest is kind of the same thing too. It's, these are more plays to be analyzed and kind of thought about in terms of like the rest of Shakespeare's work. Tempest, I do think if you are interested in kind of philosophy, thinking abstractly, then it's good because it's more of like a parable. Whereas the of the Shrew is more of like a character study. And so if you're more interested in character development, then I would go for that. Uh, this next book, Girl, Women, Other, Bernadine Averisto, uh, shared the Booker Prize last year with uh, Margaret Atwood. A lot of controversy about that and I can understand the controversy. This book is miles better than um, The Testament and I have zero idea how this book tied with The Testaments. This book definitely deserved to win the Booker. In my eyes it was a clear it was a clear win. 
so I don't know what's wrong with the Booker Prize Committee. Overall though, I, I did like this reading experience. I thought, you know, it's fragmented going between the perspectives of all these women living in the UK. I do think sometimes uh, Evaristo, she gets a little too absorbed in her own scholarly work. Uh, sometimes her characters can be too designed. You know, it feels like these characters are not real, that they don't live real lives. You know, Evaristo's hands are kind of always in the mix and you can always tell that Evaristo's kind of got an agenda when she's talking about these stories. Um, so I think the reading is good, it just sometimes doesn't feel natural. She, she doesn't always do a good job of making these characters seem fully human. All right, the next thing I did is I reread James Joyce's, James Joyce's Ulysses. Obviously, I didn't just read this in like a week. This was over um, a few months that I read this. That was one of the main reasons why I wanted to create this YouTube channel was to discuss that reading. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to sustain that that passion. This reading of Ulysses was my favorite. I think the more that you read Ulysses, the more that you get out of it. Um, so yeah, there's not much to say about this. <laughs> uh, the next thing I read was about another work of philosophy. It was uh, Giorgio Commons' Homo Saker. Very interesting book to read during the pandemic. It's about this concept of the Homo Saker, the, the person who kind of gets exiled from society. I think Agamemnon is someone, someone I definitely want to keep reading. I highly recommend this for anyone who's interested in contemporary philosophy. I Am Thou, interesting book. Uh, by Martin Buber. I would say it's kind of a work of theological philosophy. Um, I would recommend it if you're interested in existentialism. Um, it's very obscure, not very linear, which I think is what Buber wanted. It's good for people who are interested in books like uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, Swaplandia by Karen Russell. This is a book I listened to on audiobook. I thought this book was okay. I think Karen Russell is someone with a lot of heart. I thought the concept was really unique and interesting and deserving of read just for that. You know, this is a so-so kind of read. Uh, next place I read were Twelfth Night and Hamlet. Obviously Hamlet is a reread and like Romeo and Juliet, it's one of those books that I think gets put down a lot because of the angsty main character, um, but I really enjoyed rereading this. I really enjoyed all the free performances that were put online. Twelfth Night, something that uh, people re read in high school but I didn't and I think it was a little bit forgettable, something that I might need to reread again because I think a lot of the, the character development kind of went over my head. Alright, so I did read Weather by Jenny Offal, which is her most recent uh, book and like Department of Speculation, it did not click with me. Jenny Offal is probably not someone I'm going to keep following. I just don't think that her writing probably does it for me, which is too bad because it's so, she's someone that I wanted to like, but I don't know. I, I just feel like there's something something very detached about her writing. Uh, the next work I read was uh, Dave Eggers' heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius. This is kind of one of those like cult classics in the memoir genre. It's a very self-conscious writing in a way. It's, it's kind of like a meta memoir. You know, he's writing about memoir. A lot of the structure of the book is parroting the memoir, especially his famous introduction where he apologizes for wasting the reader's time. I definitely recommend this. I did not read the added part of the memoir, which is like if you turn over the book and then read the book upside down, there's like another section in the back. I didn't read that part uh, just because I felt like, you know, after you're reading like what, 300 plus pages of Dave Eggers' voice, I kind of had enough of it. And that was enjoyable. Definitely when I reread it, I, I felt like Dave Eggers' voice, it was like fascinating and funny, but it's a little overwhelming sometimes with his self-consciousness. Next play I read was Henry VI Part 1. Pretty forgettable. These plays are generally viewed as like not very good and I kind of see why. Yeah, not much to say there. Uh, same thing with Henry VI Part 2. Again, not much to say there. These are more like things that if you're interested in the history, uh, you should read these plays, but if you're interested in, you know, the best of Shakespeare, you know, not much going on here. The Hate You Give was something I wanted to read for a long time. This is another one of those recent classics in the YA genre. A lot of discussion about these books. Very, very important, I think, to read, especially for young people who just need to learn more about police brutality and about the, the issues of racial discrimination in America. I think this is a great book uh, to read to get some insight. Even if you're an adult, I think it's an important book to read. Um, because a lot of these issues of police brutality affect young people, you know, they don't just affect adults. And I think it's important to see how that affects affects the minds of kids of color. I would almost go as far as to say it's like compulsory reading, especially at the high school level. Seeing on my Shakespeare binge, we got The Winter's Tale. I almost don't remember anything that happened in this play. Maybe this is just my own bias against the comedies that, for me personally, I like the tragedies more, but... Uh, yeah, I don't remember much about The Winter's Tale. I'm going to have to reread re this one. Alright, so this is another book of philosophy called Digimodernism. It's kind of more of like a book about cultural, about culture. Um, I made a video about this, so if you want to learn more about this, you can check out that video. Uh, this next book I re is There, There by Tommy Orange. I listened to this one on audiobook. I also think this is a very important book 
um, to read. It's about the about Native American life. I think the structure of this novel is really interesting, kind of building up to the powwow at the end of the book, which culminates um, in a shooting. I think it's really. I think the character development in this book is really good. Um, and I highly recommend this book. The next thing I read, Henry VI Part Three, boring, <laughs> uh, to be perfectly honest. Tice Andronicus, this is a tragedy that I actually never heard of before this year, and I'm really glad that I read through this play. It was really, really interesting, a deep psychological play full of violence and sadness, and I just don't, I don't really understand why this play is not talked about more. I think it's because of the graphic nature of the play, but I think the tragedy is just so intense. Um, I definitely have to reread this play because I really enjoyed it. Uh, the last book I'm going to talk about, I'm probably going to split this video into two parts because this is a lot more overwhelming than I thought, is The Namesake by Junpa Lahiri. Uh, this is an author that I, I want to read more of. She's kind of one of the big names in contemporary fiction right now, and this book shows why. Um, it's a really interesting book about this Indian family who immigrate to the States. They have a kid. Um, they name him Goggle after the, the Russian author. Um, and so that's the purpose of the title, the namesake. You know, it's a little bit of kind of like literary masturbation, you know, uh, Lahiri kind of indulging herself in her own love of Goggle and Russian literature. You know, if you can withstand that, then I think this is a great read. I think the, the dad and the mom in this book are really interesting characters, and I really enjoyed following their relationships as they when they immigrated to America. It's overall a very satisfying read. I'm going to stop the video there, but stay tuned for uh, part two.